This video was made possible through the support of my patrons. Can you feel it? The turn of the earth. In 2005, after almost 16 years off the airwaves, Doctor Who was given a fiery rebirth on the BBC. Under the helm of Russell T Davis and led by the incredible Christopher Eccleston and Billy Piper, we were treated to 10 stories across 13 episodes that told the majority of the Ninth Doctor's lifespan. We saw him heal, grow and love again after his time away from TV thanks to a 19 year old woman from a London council estate. It's a tale as old as time and a tale that was constructed to be a standalone drama should the reboot fail and the team never got a second series. But how have these stories ended aged and held up over the years, and what's the cream of the crop? Well, that's what we're here to find out. So this video is going to be a brief ranking. If you want my in-depth thoughts on all of these episodes and all of these stories, then please check out my Trip of a Lifetime playlist, where I go in-depth on all of these Series 1 stories. With that out of the way, and a brief reminder to like this video and subscribe to this channel for more Doctor Who lists and reviews, let's go from a shop basement to the end of the world itself, from 19th century Cardiff to 2012 Utah, from the Mighty Jagrafess, Reapers and the Empty Child, to the God of All Daleks, this is Doctor Who Series 1 Worst to Best. No, something's wrong. I can taste it. The most frustrating part about the long game, in retrospect, is that it's a bad episode that I can't even tell you to skip. It's a pivotal middle chapter in series 1 that lays the groundwork for its incredible two-part finale. The Doctor, Rose and new companion Adam discovering the seedy underbelly of Satellite 5 which is broadcasting fake news to the uncritical fourth great and bountiful human empire and it's a great idea for a novel or a longer format that can effectively world build. Here we're just expected to take everybody's word for the state of the place with the telling instead of showing uncharacteristically out of control for a Russell T. Davis script. Don't get me wrong, I think this socio political commentary is worth exploring. God damn, is it worth exploring, but in an episode that fleshes out its world and supporting cast much more effectively. Instead, we get a subplot with the companion who couldn't with Adam Mitchell, a concept worth exploring, just maybe not in this particular episode. It feels redundant anyway, especially because Series 1 already established Mickey as the companion who could not handle the Doctor's lifestyle, though Adam's story gifts us with Tamsin Gregg, here gunning for the award of Best Supporting Character in Doctor Who history. Simon Pegg is a riot in the ice-covered Floor 500 of Satellite 5, and I love the heel turn of Anna Maxwell Martin, but this is a case of the sum of the long game's parts not adding up to a compelling whole, with an uninspired Jagrafest design and such a little legwork done by the story itself to really sell the information warfare taking place in this bleak future. It's not terrible, but if you wanted to watch Russell T Davis really excel with this particular social commentary, then watch Years and Years. There's a reason that series is six episodes. As for myself, I await a target novelization, which could give us a thorough peek behind the curtain of the year 200,000. As it stands right now, the long game is a missed opportunity, but an effective inciting incident where the Doctor just walks away assuming that humanity will be able to solve its own problems. Doctor, I hope the Bear With Me Celebrity Edition where the bear got in the bath was worth it. Excuse me, do you mind not farting while I'm saving the world? Yeah. 
Doctor Who responding to 9-11, Mr. Enter would be proud. But while the show's first cliffhanger of the century was an effective one, and the Slovene were a great demonstration of a modern-day iconic villain with terrific performances from all involved, this is a story where the big narrative swings feel hollow. The least interesting parts of Aliens of London and World War III are the aliens in London trying to start World War III. With Russell T Davis's penchant for compelling domestic dramas coming forward, with Jackie reacting to Rose returning after 12 months, the press reaction to a spaceship hitting Big Ben and crashing in the Thames, and characters like Mickey really starting to come into their own. Andrew Cartmel ran in 1989 so that Russell could run in 2005, though the Doctor trying desperately to escape her in part one and then torn over losing her in part two stretches credibility almost as much as Mickey using his PC to hack into the Royal Navy with the password Buffalo. We've got the spectacle of aliens in Downing Street and the stakes of nuclear Armageddon, but the tone is all over the map, made more disappointing when the Slovene actors consistently do their best work when they're acting more serious. This two-parter is important, and it sets the tone for the rest of the era, but while there are teething problems, the heart and the performances do shine through. Though the Slovene theme tune, that's an absolute bop. Love it, love it, love it. Dinner in bondage works for me. We have our calm before the storm that is the series one finale, and we find the ninth doctor dining with monsters, as Margaret Slovene survived the destruction of Downing Street to become the mayor of Cardiff. The third act of Boomtown gives audiences their obligatory spectacle and citywide destruction at alien hands, but the lead up to that has Margaret Slovene hold the doctor to task for the destruction his lifestyle creates. We have characters like Rose and the newly joined Captain Jack endorsing and supporting this behaviour, but we also get a look at Mickey, who is, in the end, a victim of the Doctor. The opening act is fun, if a bit too sickly sweet, but everything pays off at that dinner scene, where Christopher Eccleston gives one of his most underrated performances as the Doctor, and Annette Badland holds her own as a villain able to match him. I never thought I could feel sorry for an eight-foot-tall alien crying on a toilet, but damn it, this episode made it happen. And whether it's Mickey trying to make peace and compromise with Rose, or the Doctor trying his very best to justify sending Margaret to her death, on her home planet, it's brilliantly and sensitively directed by Joe Ahern. Unfortunately, when the town starts booming at the end, these promising narrative threads get dropped. Rose just runs away from Mickey, and it turns out that Margaret was not a reformed villain, but was just buying time. And the TARDIS gave her a second chance anyway, preventing the Doctor from having to make a decision. Props for trying, but it seemed like Russell T. Davis spent this episode asking interesting questions, and then just deciding not to answer them. I'm the doctor, by the way. What's your name? Rose. Nice to meet you, Rose. Run for your life! Some of the special effects are dated, the editing is very early 2000s, and the sound mix is off, whether it be the home media music or the live TV Graham Norton, but Rose still holds up as a narratively polished and effective introduction to the Doctor and his universe. Using the Autons as a link to the classic series, whilst still feeling modern and contemporary, was an inspired, genius choice. We've also got the framing of the Doctor's introduction in that basement, like he's breaking the horror genre in two across his knee, and Billy Piper's grounded reactions to the madness around her immediately endears her to new audiences. This episode is the full package. That TARDIS reveal is so thoughtfully constructed, the Doctor's moral code of violence as a last resort is organically communicated to the audience, though that same audience leaves this episode knowing full well that Rose has now entered a world of threat and danger. The scenes with Clive feel very meta, reflecting an obsessed fan base throughout the wilderness years while further hitting home these themes. 
Murray Gold's music thunders the audience along. Director Keith Boak's short time on the show helped to ground the pilot and enforce the style guidelines that would allow audiences to relate to this far out concept. And the episode is full of cheeky but scary behind the sofa moments. Yeah, you may have laughed at the burping bin, but I specifically remember that scene being the moment in 2005 that I realized I was hooked. <laughs> It's a pilot with real energy and great kinetic pace to it that almost forces the audience to go along with it despite a production that is rough around the edges. Its ranking on this list isn't to indicate that Rose is bad because it isn't, in fact it's really good, it just shows how much higher Series 1 had yet to climb over the next three months of TV. And BBC dramas would never be the same again. Moisturize me, moisturize me. Russell T. Davis channels Douglas Adams to mixed results, but you've still got to admire the audacity of the BBC Wales production that no one had faith in in 2005, deciding to throw every alien design at the wall and depicting the existential horror of watching your planet become rocks and dust at the hands of an expanding sun. The results of this production are thoroughly mixed, as for every Cassandra, who's got an amazing concept and visual effects creation, you also get your Mr. and Mrs. Paku. For every face of Bo or Mox of Balhoon, you get the brothers Hop Pileen. However, the kitchen sink approach gives the end of the world an odd charm. I can't help but respect it, all things considered, even if the humour is all over the shop and its attempts at action set pieces just amount to fighting with control panels to pop music. What we have here, though, is an unconventional apocalypse story with a beautiful ending where the Doctor is grounded to Earth and Rose decides to not confine herself like Cassandra and decides to live in the moment and get chips. It's a wonderful, low-key ending for an episode that marketed and prided itself on its visual effects, which, oddly enough, despite being over 17 years old, do hold up for the most part. Mainly because it's not just the technical horsepower driving the episode, but inspired production design, with the expected metal corridors of a space station replaced with something more akin to an orbital cathedral, or the amazing design and makeups of the Forest of Cheem, and just some terrific lighting from cinematographer Ernie Vince. One day, we as fans will likely look back on this episode in the same way that we look back on stories like the web planet from the 1960s, but it is not this day. Also, that scene with Rose and Raffalo, one of the best scenes of the series, and it's amazing to think it was the very last thing included just to fill time. I love a happy medium. <laughs> Supernatural horror, a wintry atmosphere, and a macabre sense of humour was just what the Doctor ordered for the TARDIS's first trip back in time for the revival. Penned by superfan and Wilderness Years scribe Mark Gatiss, this tongue-in-cheek piece of phantasmagoria drips in the gothic sensibilities that inspired 19th century writers like Charles Dickens, who fits right into this story. I often wonder what might have been in 1860s Naples, but Cardiff 1860 still looks so lusciously presented. The concept of creatures living inside of the gas systems that were becoming more prominent at the time is inspired, and the actual look and the minimalist design of the Gelth gives the story a real air of legitimacy to it. Couple that with the funeral parlour setting, the telepathic servant girl, and a full-blown seance, the unquiet dead ticks all of the boxes. It also excels across the spectrum of character development as well, from minor roles that are instantly endearing, a full-blown Scrooge arc for Charles Dickens, a peek behind the curtain of the Doctor's moral code, even if it gets him into trouble sometimes, and Rose having to grapple with the morality of travelling across the fourth dimension. It's a really wonderful story, and I think in any other series it would have been way higher, but with an incredible run like Series 1, it has to settle where it is. Now, don't take the ranking of this top four too seriously, because these are all brilliant, near-perfect stories. With that being said, 
Let's light up the comment section. I am my mommy. <laughs> I'm going to get emails about this one, but this was not a light decision. Like I said, the top quartet of stories here are top tier Doctor Who, but by nature of this list, some of them had to rank above others, so some hard choices had to be made. Stephen Moffat bursts out of the gate in series one with one of Doctor Who's scariest stories, set in the oppressive and perpetual night of World War II Blitz London and making its central antagonist just a kid who's lost his mum in the conflict. The theming is so strong in this story. The empty child is empty, because he's literally empty, but he's also got no identity. And the Doctor dances with the friends we f along the way. This story introduces many of the tropes that we come to love Stephen Moffat for, like inventive set pieces, the Doctor's interplay with children, great TARDIS imagery, and using the soundscape to set up brilliant behind the sofa scares, but we also have some of the horniness that would become infamous in later seasons, which feels a bit misplaced after an episode where the ninth Doctor and Rose are set up much more as a father-daughter dynamic than a romantic partnership. Personally, I prefer the more literal reading of the story, where it's actually about dancing and the Doctor moving to his own tempo to contrast against the suave, violent Captain Jack in an outcome where everybody lives instead. There's only a handful of locations, but they're so thoughtfully presented and used to make this story appear much bigger and more ambitious than it actually is. We've got Dr. Constantine and Nancy as some of the best supporting characters of the series, and one-liners that are so brilliant and funny, they're still quoted in the fandom to this day. Rose, I'm, I'm trying to resonate concrete. So why the placement? It's partly due to age. This put the fear of God into me when I first watched it back in 2005, but even the best scares can become dulled with enough repetition. And like I said, the Dr. Rose dynamic feels a bit at odds with the rest of the episodes, but I have very few complaints here. And at the end of the day, when I watch that scene where the gas mask forces its way out of Richard Wilson's mouth and we hear the skull cracking apart, God, it takes me back to 2005 all over again. Little did we know at the time, however, that Stephen Moffat was far from done scaring the nation's children. Exterminate. <laughs> Robert Shearman, adapting his 2003 Big Finish audio story Jubilee to a post-Time War context, ensured his legacy in the annals of great Doctor Who writers with Dalek. We're given a tense and genuinely scary slasher story that brought the Daleks to mainstream prominence once again as malicious exterminators who had previously spent the best part of two decades as a pop culture punchline. Now I say that this episode is scary, and part of that is because of the Dalek itself, how it methodically moves through Van Staten's museum, not wasting a shot, moving and elevating with purpose and elegance. But it's also a scary story because we see our hero, the Doctor, lash out in such an uncharacteristically violent way. How we see him initially sympathize with the tortured Metaltron in the cage, but as soon as he realizes it's an unarmed Dalek, he laughs at it, he gleefully appropriates its battle cry, and attempts to destroy it himself. Eccleston's performance in this scene, alone with a broken pepper pot chained to the centre of this prison, is extraordinary and so intense and charged. The audience have spent over a month growing to know this doctor, only to have the rug pulled from under them when they learn how much he's truly hurting and how violent and aggressive he can really be. And Rose's journey as she tries to escape the base with companion hopeful Adam puts her directly in the firing line of not just the Dalek who's desperate to escape, but also the Doctor, willing to do anything to stop it. Honestly, I've talked about this story so much. I've reviewed it twice. I did a shot-by-shot -shot analysis with this episode's director, Joe Ahern. I did a lengthy interview with its writer, Rob Sherman, last year. I might be all talked out of Dalek, so if you want to hear my thoughts on it more, you've got lists, you've got playlists in the description. It's given me a lot. 
but it has, to its credit, a lot to give. It's one of the best directed episodes, it's got an all-time great Doctor performance, and that ending has my eyes welling up every single time. I couldn't... I wasn't... Oh god, it's happening again. And go to the next one, the next one! Who's that? It's your daddy. Oh, great, more tears. Looking back, I consider Father's Day, written by Paul Cornell, to be the definitive Rose Tyler story. It's definitely the story where Billy Piper delivers her best performance and turned any doubters and naysayers who initially thought she was just a stunt cast pop star. By the end of this 43 minute episode, Billy certifies herself as one of the best actors working today, as Rose Tyler is put through the ringer and crashes into adulthood as this trip in the TARDIS rips away the rose tinted glasses pun intended, that makes up the foundations of her family life. That the drunken stories that her mother would tell her as she went through the photo album were just that, stories. That her father wasn't some genius who was one great idea away from riches, but was an unfaithful Dell boy who even tries to hit on her. And we have the doctor wanting to show off his mastery of time and indulges Rose, only to feel that she's betrayed his trust and he threatens to leave her only for his police box to be empty. Such a wonderful image, as is the image of the car that was supposed to strike Pete Tyler down, just driving around the church over and over again, waiting for Pete to collide with it. It's not the Monster of the Week Reapers that make the horrific impression in Father's Day, but Twilight Zone concepts like that. Brilliant scene after brilliant scene, some of Murray Gold's best, though more minimalistic music, Father's Day is such a triumph that grounded this era of Doctor Who as prestige drama rather than campy sci-fi. All these years later, we look back on series one with its epic stories, its out there settings, its Dalek armadas, but on reflection, I also think of series one as the series that brought us a family drama that's mainly set in a church amongst ordinary people with only one man who can save the day by accepting his death and becoming the father Rose needs him to be. Unfortunately, that also means he can't be there for her anymore. Who am I, love? My daddy. Have a good life. Do that for me, Rose. Have a fantastic life. Much like Dalek, what else can I say? I can't deny that this decision is swayed slightly by this finale broadcasting at just the right time for me, and that this conclusion to series one is what made me the fan I am today, but on its own, even without that impact, Bad Wolf and the Parting of the Ways is such terrific, exceptional TV. While references to early 2000s pop culture might date Bad Wolf in an aesthetic sense, the idea of death by game show and death by reality TV seems to get more relevant with every passing year. Blimey, Russell T Davis had his finger on the pulse of that one. It's a great setup episode that introduces us to the wonderful Linda with a Y, and now I remember what happens to her now, and I'm sad. Much like their reintroductory appearance in Dalek, the Pepper Pots here are scary, their threat bolstered by the reintroduction of the Dalek Emperor with a massive god complex, truly making this the biggest foe that the Ninth Doctor ever faced on screen. And the odds against him were so great that he took Rose out of the conflict and Captain Jack was prepared to die fighting against them. But when Rose goes back home and basically lays out the whole point of Series 1 in that takeaway, everything fits into place, and we realise that over the past 13 episodes, the Doctor may have always found himself kidnapped, trapped, or in some cases just outright dead, but he was able to make the people around him better. He was a Doctor, and now it's time for that to pay off with Rose as well, 
who comes back to save him. And while she is a deus ex machina, as she becomes the envoy of the bad wolf, it is one that does come with a cost, as this doctor takes the fatal power of the bad wolf from her, but he needs to lose this life in order to do so, and audiences are treated to an incredible summation of what regeneration is in around three minutes to ease the transition to a new audience to a new doctor, with Christopher Eccleston saying goodbye with a beaming smile on his face. It's just so perfect top to bottom. The ninth doctor storming through the big brother house, that cliffhanger for the Daleks, the massacre on floor zero, the big yellow truck, I love it so much. Much like Dalek, I've said so much about this story already, so I'll leave it there for now. Except this last point, the android is the best wordplay in the history of Doctor Who and I will not be taking questions at this time. It's for these reasons and more that Bad Wolf and the Parting of the Ways is the best story of Doctor Who Series 1. Hey folks, thanks so much for watching this ranking video. I was meant to do this at the end of Trip of a Lifetime last year, but just didn't get around to it. I'm very sorry. But if you enjoyed this video, make sure to subscribe to this channel to keep up to date on all other Doctor Who related content I've got in the pipeline. Be sure to hit that like button as well because it really, really helps me out. And if you want to support my channel in other ways, you can do so by becoming a patron. Patrons get these videos early, they get access to a Mr. Tardis Discord server and many other perks along the way. I'd like to give a shout out to these particular patrons. Andrew, James Raby, Dean Jones, Andrew Blewett, Callum Baird, Dylan Whitaker, Flipmeister MK, Hunter Graham, Jared Saylor, Jeremy K. Duncan, John Campbell Reese, Cafe Mewtwo, Leela, Mario Fanboy 15, Matthew Perry, Michael Serrano, Miranda Logan, Nate Harris, Palex, Raven Woods, The Brit Sniper, Toby Loxton, Lily Who, Dan the Goblin, Nathaniel Holden, Samuel Brooks, Zabi555, Adam Gratton, Angus Bajanison, Christian Rowley, Daniel Davis, Darius, Darren Carver Balsiger, Evil Dalek 79, Finley Rude, Ginger Animator, Harvey Smith, Jack D. Evans, James Ivory, James Morris Wyatt, Joseph Adams, King of the Sandmen, Rebecca Hill, Reese Lloyd, Ricky Temple, Ross, Ryan Duncan, Samuel Whitaker, Steve Fiore, Taylor Wooderson, Will, and Zach Conway. Thank you to all of those patrons, they help to keep the lights on here on this channel. Thank you so much to everybody on that list and those people in the credits as well. And everyone, I'll see you all next time.